channel open. Welcome back to Weekly Trek, a proud member of the Tricorder Transmissions podcast network and presented in partnership with TrekCore.com. I am your host, Alex Perry. What's today's date? The date. Today's show was recorded on December 17th, 2021, and is current through the Star Trek Discovery episode, The Examples, so beware of spoilers. And if you are in one of the regions where Star Trek Discovery or Star Trek Prodigy has not yet aired, and you are trying to stay spoiler-free, be sure to check the episode article on TrekCore for time codes for each of our stories tonight in order to avoid them. All right, let's get into the show. Good day, Voyager, and welcome to A Briefing with Neelix. It's a catchy title, isn't it? Weekly Trek is a 40-minute news show covering the biggest stories from the Star Trek franchise. We are in a new golden age of Star Trek. There are multiple television shows in production, possibly more on the way, and enough merchandise to fill the Bajoran wormhole. So stick with me and I'll help you sort the real facts from a lot of the Dominion propaganda that you'll find online. But I can't do this alone. And my guest this week is returning guest, Chris Vanderkam. Chris, welcome back to Weekly Trek. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for having me back. All right, Chris. Well, you know the drill by now. I want to know something that's got you excited about Star Trek at the moment. What's got you moving at Warp 10? I have really been enjoying the watch party that I have been doing with one of my fandom besties on the other side of the pond. We have managed so far, now that Discovery is available over in the UK, we have managed to find a time each weekend where we can watch Discovery together and chat over over text about it. So that's been really fun. And we're doing that this Sunday. So that's what I'm excited about for episode five. Uh Aha. So you haven't seen episode five yet. Is that right? I haven't. I have been waiting for my watch party. Very, very cool. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. But don't worry about spoilers. I'm okay with, I'm okay with hearing something about it. Okay. Got it. Got it. There is one. So my theory for this week There is one element about the episode, which is not a huge, it's not really a spoiler. It's more just, there's a particular reference that I'm using to build a theory, but I won't talk about the events of the episode or anything like that. And it's immaterial to ultimately the plot of it. Um, But that's very cool. Yeah. I mean, Star Trek shared is, is the best kind of Star Trek as far as I'm concerned. So that's, that's really, really cool. And I mean, Hey, that's some time difference to try and have to figure out, you know, make a time to do that. Yeah. It's worked out pretty well so far. I think we've missed one weekend where just schedules didn't line up. Uh, I was out of town. But other than that, it's it's just been so much fun. And I think, you know, it's one of the good things to come out of this whole pandemic because I don't think we really would have thought about that if all of us hadn't been more open to the whole remote communication. Sure, yeah, absolutely. All right, well, the thing I'm feeling good about Star Trek this week is just sort of a general reflection, which is, for those of you who follow me on Twitter will know that I started uh, several months ago doing a full franchise rewatch. It's the 55th anniversary. I tend to do a complete one. I did one for the 50th. I'm now doing one for the 55th. Presumably I'll then do another one for the 60th. And last time in when I did it for the 50th, I did it in production order. So started with TOS. At that point, ran all the way through Enterprise and then the Kelvin Timeline movies, which was all we had at that point. No discovery yet. So now I'm doing the rewatch and this time I'm doing it in in in-universe chronological order, which doesn't mean I'm doing every section of every episode that takes place in the past. You have to watch that for any of the others. Just sort of the kind of broad strokes. Started with Enterprise, then did the first two seasons of Discovery, then TOS, then did the animated series, then did the TOS movies. And now I am just started Next Generation. I'm now about halfway through season one of Star Trek The Next Generation. And I am having a really, really nice time with this rewatch. I loved Enterprise. I loved rewatching the original series. I'm loving rewatching season one of The Next Generation, which, you know, it's not the best show in the world, but I'm just having a great time with it. I'm having a really nice time revisiting all these episodes. I didn't particularly care for the animated series. I've never particularly cared for the animated series. I found new things to appreciate about it, but I am just having a real, and and even, you know, rewatching the TOS movies, I just, I just had a really nice time doing it. So, you know, there are times when Star Trek obviously has been a massive component of my life for 20, 
seven years or so now and you know there's I, I probably ha- have never gone more than a couple of weeks without ever watching an episode of Star Trek normally go a couple of days without watching some kind of episode of Star Trek and there are times when you watch it and you know you're just sort of going through the motions because you're just not really feeling it and then there are times you're watching it and you're just totally vibing with everything about it and so far this whole rewatch I have just been completely vibing with it so I'm having a terrific terrific time with it that sounds amazing I should really, you know, I should do that. And there's a lot of gaps in my own watching patterns. So maybe for the 60th, I should just sit down and and go through the whole thing. And by then, you know, who knows how much more we're going to have. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Given another five years. I mean, already, because I, you know, I was thinking about this, you know, we've got Discovery season four on right now. So I did the first two seasons of Discovery and then I did TOS and then I'll do all the 24th century stuff. And then I'll come back to Discovery right at the end and do the third, fourth hopefully fifth season. But yeah, so season four is now baked into this watch because it'll be finished by the time I get there. Picard season two almost certainly will be as well. Prodigy season one will be. And depending on how slow I am, it's like, well, Strangely Worlds, I'm already past that point in the timeline. But like, if I really hit a roadblock and I slow down, you know, could I even catch in like Lower Deck season three if that ultimately comes out next summer as well? So that's the, that's the other cool thing. This is the first time I've done one of these franchise rewatches where there's actually new Star Trek coming out that is kind of adding itself into the watch as I go, which is a very fun experience. Now, have you done any math as to how many hours it's going to take you? Well, I think it's, what is it? It's it's 800, we're up to 815 episodes or something like that, which is probably somewhere in the region of 850. Well, because it's it's 45 minutes an episode. So, you know, it probably breaks out as somewhere... I would say between seven and 800 hours worth of actual watching, maybe a little under 700. Um, but then you got to add in the movies and, and that, you know, those, those count, even though they count as only one entry, they count as multiple hours. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to guess it's somewhere in the region of like, let's say 675 hours to get through the whole thing. Well, I have just Googled and I don't know how accurate this number is. Like if it's factoring in yeah, what does it say? everything else. So Google says every single television series as of January 22nd totals up to 626 hours. Oh, and I was pretty close. Minutes. Uh, so that takes you 26 days. And then all 13 of the films have a combined total of 25 hours and 17 minutes. Oh, so that gets you to like 6.50. I'm I'm feeling pretty good about my estimation. Yeah, you were real close. (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, and I think I'm probably maybe 200, it'll be probably even less than that. 150 hours of the way through. So I still got a lot of Star Trek still to come. Yeah, that sounds like you you might make it to Strange New Worlds. Yeah, I could very realistically, I think. All right, well, with that, let's turn to the week's top stories. There's a war going on and I'm a reporter. There's lots of Star Trek to look forward to in 2022, as we were just talking about. And one project on the way that lots of people are looking forward to is the new 4K remastering of the Star Trek The Motion Picture Director's Edition, which we got a new glimpse at this week with some teaser images. The movie, whose only previous release was on standard definition DVD in 2002, is getting a full 4K remaster for the 20th anniversary release of the movie next year, and is expected to be released exclusively on Paramount+. Plus and then almost certainly later on home media. We've only had one quick glimpse of the movie's 4K upgrade so far, which we got at Star Trek Day, just literally like a two-second shot. But this week, StarTrek.com released a new look at the movie in the form of some new images of select shots from the 4K remaster. And they look great! We got a look at the remastered Vulcan establishing shot, some of the Vija effects that were added for the director's edition, and the shot of Admiral Kirk touring the Enterprise exterior with the reflection of the Enterprise in the window. In addition to the new images, producer on the project David C. Fain has said that, quote, using scans of original 1979 photography plates, including some intended to be used but were omitted at the time, our team is digitally recombining these elements to present them as they were originally intended, and with a clarity and quality unimaginable. 
imagined. I can't wait for everybody to see it. And what does that mean? Well, in another preview image of work underway, that seems to mean that they are doing something that, that has been missing from Star Trek The Motion Picture since it hit theaters, which is in the shot where the Enterprise leaves dry dock, Earth is nowhere to be seen. And according to this preview image, it looks like they are finally in a position to be able to add a shot of Earth back into the movie, which is very exciting. And it also means it's exciting to think about what else might be included when the movie finally releases next year. I think we were expecting it was sort of going to be just a straight up 4K remaster of the director's edition in 2002, exactly the way that you saw it. And maybe there might be a couple more surprises along the way for us to look forward to. Chris, tell me, have you have you ever had the pleasure of watching the director's edition of Star Trek The Motion Picture? Well, I have to make a confession. I'm pretty sure I have watched it, but it was back in college, and I am also pretty sure I wasn't precisely sober when I watched it. <laughs> so I think that... Returning to our, our previous point of discussion, I think that uh, seeing the the sneaks that we're getting uh, with the with the remaster, this is more incentive that I need to do a full rewatch of the franchise um, and, and get to appreciate the movie not only while I am sober. <laughs> but in its, in its new remastered glory. Well, no, I mean, I think this is great, right? Because I, I've seen the, anytime I watch the motion picture, the, I in the rewatch I just did, I watched the theatrical edition because I wanted to see it in 4K. But anytime I previously watched the motion, uh, the motion picture, it's been the director's edition. So I feel like I know the director's edition pretty well at this point, and I'm going to have a great time watching it in 4K, but it's ultimately a movie that I think I know versus I'm actually really envious of people who... You know, my first experience of watching the motion picture director's edition, I mean, obviously you had one too, but we'll set that aside because we'll say maybe that doesn't count. My experience of watching it was, you know, on a 28 inch widescreen CRT television that was probably like two feet wide and three feet deep. And, uh, you know, on the original DVD, because that's the only way that you've been able to watch it up to this point. And so getting the opportunity to experience it afresh or I guess in your case, experience it a sober is going to be just a, like a, a delightful experience. I think the motion picture director's edition is a significant improvement upon the theatrical release of the movie. And yeah, I'm really excited for this project. I think it's going to be great. The images look beautiful. I'm so impressed. I continue to be impressed with all of these classic legacy properties, getting the full modern treatment, getting remastered, getting rebrought to life and, and how they've just been able to really take quality to to a new level with all this stuff. It's just amazing. And, and I salute the creative efforts of all of the teams that are involved. Yeah. And I really like the way in the image they released of the establishing shot of Vulcan, which is right before Spock basically flunks out of the colonar. What they've done is even more so than the original director's edition they've brightened up the scene and it and it makes all the sense in the world that they've done that because in the theatrical edition you get this map painting and it's basically vulcan at night and then you cut in to spark and he is like shielding his eyes from the sun and it just never it just does not tonally make sense because there is no like clearly it was intended to be a daytime scene but the map painting establishes it's at night and then even the director's edition it sort of establishes it's like a misty afternoon type thing whereas this 4k remaster implies nope this is the height of it's like this is vulcan like daytime right and you're in the desert and so i think Obviously, we'll have to wait until we see it all kind of, you know, we've just seen a still image, but I can imagine the transition from that kind of really bright establishing shot to Spark covering his eyes because it's really bright out will make just, it just all fits together so much better. And it's those kinds of details, which when they add up over the course of a movie where there's a ton of those, just those little things that just don't quite work, the movie itself doesn't quite work. But if you can fix some of that, yeah, you're you're not going to take the motion picture from being what it is is to something less or more than that, but you can make some really significant improvements and, and they have done that and it's really nice to see. Definitely. And I think your your point about getting the movie to hang together better, getting those little connections working better, it's such a great thing to see because it's obviously a labor of love. Like these are the things that fans have noticed over the years and these are people saying, we're going to devote time and energy and resources and brain power to making this work better. 
Well, Secret Hideout, the production company run by Alex Kurtzman that has shepherded this modern era of Star Trek since Star Trek Discovery premiered on then CBS All Access in 2017, is getting a shakeup in its executive ranks, and a familiar name from the credits of Star Trek shows over the last five years may soon be disappearing. Heather Caden, who has run Secret Hideout alongside Alex Kurtzman for the last 12 years as president of television, will be departing the role in the coming weeks. Heather and I have spent 12 extraordinary years together, and in that time, she's been a brilliant creative force whose passion and dedication have been felt by the many writers and directors we work with at Secret Hideout, Kurtzman said. I'm certain she'll carry that passion into the next phase of her amazing career. I'm so grateful for the time we've shared, and I wish her every success and happiness on her bright road ahead. It is unclear if Caden will remain attached in any way to the show she has already had a hand in, that being Discovery, Picard, Lower Decks, Prodigy, Strange New Worlds, but she will have no role going forward on new shows produced by Secret Hideout. Aaron Byers, who has been Caden's number two at Secret Hideout and whose name is also in the credits for all of the shows I just named, will be taking over her role. Chris, I doubt you have a strong opinion on executive changes at Alex Kurtzman's production company, aside from Heather Caden showing up and giving interviews about Star Trek. It's always been deeply unclear to me exactly what she did because I'm not an entertainment industry professional and I don't understand that world. But like, let's take a step back. I mean, you know, Secret Hideout, they have been the production company that has been more or less running the Star Trek franchise for the last five years. Like, how are you feeling about the role that they've had during that time? You know, I I think that there's, it it always makes you a little bit nervous when there's a shakeup in leadership. And I I think about this, like, in terms of of a different business. Like, what happens when somebody that's in a C-suite leaves? And sometimes you barely even notice. And sometimes things go in a completely different direction. And I I kind of feel like this is going to be more of the former rather than the latter, because Alex Kurtzman's been the face of all of this for for the last five years. And we've certainly heard from, from Heather Caden, but it's been very, very clear that Alex is the person who's ultimately making the decisions in the room. So I feel like we're going to not really notice, especially with her number two, ascending into her role. Yeah, it feels like there's a, you're 100% right about that. It feels like there's a big difference between creative and operational, right? Mm -hmm. And Alex Kurtzman's creative. He's the guy who makes decisions about what the shows are going to look like and what the stories are going to be and what the shows are going to be and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and helps write episodes and things. And then Heather Caden's the operational side. She's the one who helps figure out how mechanically to do the creative things that Alex Kurtzman is the one who decides upon. So yeah, hopefully it's one of those things where, I mean, and of course, you know, if if folks don't like the creative direction that Secret Hideout has been taking things in, I'm sorry, Heather Caden leaving is not going to change that because that's Alex Kurtzman, not Heather Caden. But for those who like the creative direction of the franchise under Secret Hideout, Heather Caden leaving probably does not have that big of an impact because she is more on the operations side, at least as far as I can tell, than the creative side. You know, the making it happen. We got to go out and rent studio space and we've got to make the financials work. And right, like, I think that's the side of the business that she helps run versus we're going to make the enterprise look different. And do we end this season on a cliffhanger or not? And, uh, you know, do we redo the uniforms this season type thing, right? Like, or, you know, do we bring back this legacy character? All of those conversations seem like they fall more on the Alec Kurtzman side of the business. So, but I mean, you know, deeply grateful to Heather for all of her work on the Star Trek franchise over the last, I'm sure it's been, oh, it's definitely been longer than five years, just five years since Discovery started premiering, but the company was working on the franchise for a couple of years before that. And I I think previous to that, before it was Secret Hideout, the company was working on the J.J. Abrams Star Trek movies when it was Alex Kurtzman and Robert Orkey who were kind of the heads of the proto-Secret Hideout. So yeah, really grateful to Heather for everything she has done for the Star Trek franchise. But yeah, I think I'm with you. I don't don't know that we'll necessarily notice all that much difference, but hey, you know, thank you, Heather, and good luck with whatever your next job is. Well, Amazon Prime Video have released this week a new one-hour documentary on William Shatner's brief space flight aboard Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin and his journey to becoming the oldest man in space. The documentary premiered earlier this week on December 15th, 
and provides more footage of the space flight and reflections from Shatner on his experience and his growing friendship with Amazon founder Jeff Bezos. Whoa. My time in space was the most profound experience I could have ever imagined, said Shatner. This special documenting my journey gives a dramatic view of that experience, and my hope is it inspires the world to see we must go to space to save Earth. Chris, what was your reaction to William Shatner's flight to space back in October? I, I think I can probably sum it up as, uh... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Now, okay, so I like the the idea of it. Like, yes, I, I don't think we can argue that Shatner has made enormous contributions to to Star Trek and to the fandom, and he has an incredible legacy as Kirk. So the idea of, yeah, let's send him to space for real, that's kind of cool. But on the other hand, I have a lot of problems with the resources that are going into space tourism. You're right. So it's certainly... I'm glad that he enjoyed it. I'm glad that it was meaningful for him. And I, I know a lot of people got really excited and thought it was really cool. And the kid in me thought it was cool too. And the the documentary might even be interesting. Like there is something to be said for someone of his age being able to go to space. That's kind of cool. There might be, I don't know if the documentary is covering any of like the science or the, those kind of things, but, but yeah, so it might, might be interesting. Yeah. I don't know if I'm going to bother with this one. It just feels like a, again, it's, you know, and I, I sort of talked about this at the time, so I, I don't want to do too much repeating myself, but the moment when he stepped off the capsule and like, you know, had his sort of big, what seemed like very spontaneous kind of speech and reflections on what he had experienced was was very moving. But everything else about this is a crash commercial exercise to sort of burnish the publicity for Blue Origin and encourage other people to pay for flights on the rocket. And I don't think we should necessarily look at this documentary as being anything other than in the fine spirit of exactly that, right? It's a giant commercial for going to space in which William Shatner's experience is being used as a and you could have this experience too, right? Like, I might be wrong about that. You know, I'm, I, and it's only an hour long. So, you know, I might check it out. But it's also just like, I don't know. I, I was very satisfied to listen to him speak for five minutes about his experience when he got off the capsule. It was a very you know, sort of uh, moving set of commentary about how this experience had fundamentally changed him. And I found it very moving. And now I'm just reflecting on the fact that, you know, he's now back to like, to tweeting angrily at 16 year olds on Twitter again. So, you know, it <laughs> the experience did not change him perhaps as much as I think we had necessarily hoped that it would. But hey, if you're a huge Shatner fan, and if you enjoyed the Blue Origin Space Flight, which again, I watched the whole thing. I really enjoyed so certain moments of it, then this documentary might give you a bit more kind of flavor of that in the way that you're looking for. So, you know, Amazon Prime Video, which of course, you know, again, Amazon, Jeff Bezos, Blue Origin, it's all tied together. It's all just one big company commercial. Maybe I should uh, repeat my college experience with the motion picture and watch the documentary <laughs> in a not precisely sober state. You know, I think that's probably going to be the best way to experience it. <laughs> And lastly this week, Factory Entertainment have announced the release of what is sure to be the most specific and one of the most expensive Star Trek collectibles ever produced. To coincide with the 25th anniversary of the release of Star Trek First Contact, Factory Entertainment have released a prop replica reproduction of the Borg Queen's skull from the end of the movie. The replica is copied from one that is still in the possession of CBS and will be over 35 inches in length. The main body is cast from heavyweight polyurethane resin with with an electroplated chrome finish. The replica is augmented by various plastic and rubber parts to match the original prop and features an articulated spinal cord. On screen, the prop was presented as being heavily damaged by corrosive plasma, so each replica has been hand weathered to lend a battle damaged appearance. Electronic light features have been incorporated to simulate the special effects seen on screen. These include multiple LEDs and a fade out sequence that replicates the moment that the Borg Queen ceased to function. This whopper of a collectible looks awesome. Factory Entertainment released some preview images of the piece and it does look stunningly like the prop from the movie, but it is not for Star Trek fans on a budget. This 
strictly limited piece, which is limited to 250 editions, will include a display stand and plaque signed by Bull Queen actress Alice Krieger and is available for pre-order now for, I hope you are sitting down, $1,499. Factory Entertainment will only be making 250 of these, so if this is something that's in your price range and of interest to you, and I'm sure there are folks for which both of those things are true, I recommend you move quickly in order to secure your Borg Queen skull. Factory Entertainment expects the piece will ship in time for this year's first contact day, that being April 5th, 2022. Chris, I'm not going to ask if this is something you're planning to buy because I'm guessing the answer is no. There are probably only 250 people on this entire planet who Factory Entertainment is expecting to purchase a piece that's $1,500. But if money was no issue and you could have someone make the weirdest and most specific Star Trek collectible ever, what would you want someone to make? Well, I don't know if it's weird, but I, I think I would be willing to pay that kind of money for a really high quality full metal enterprise that I could hang from the ceiling. Oh, very nice. Yeah. I mean, I think I might have to reinforce my ceiling, (laughs) but, but just with some of the, with the quality that we've seen coming out from some of these pieces lately, yeah, a, a full metal enterprise, maybe with some lights would really tempt me. You're uh, not tempted by the uh, also hang from the ceiling Playmobil Enterprise? I'm a little tempted. Everybody's an enabler. (laughs) How close have you come? We'll we'll see whether I get my bonus this year. (laughs) Ah, well, we're keeping our fingers crossed for that then. It's a very cool piece. I mean, the size of it. The lights, the little, you know, the fact that it opens up and you've got the bridge and like even the chairs are removable. I think that's really great. You know, and I'm not as much for the collectible merchandise stuff, but I have been tempted by the Playmobil one. But I think, yeah, if money was absolutely no object and I could pay somebody to make me the make me a full metal one, I would do that. That is very cool. I'm, I asked the question now I'm trying to think what the answer would be. I gotta admit, though, this Borg skull looks amazing. It is cool, isn't it? I mean, it, it, like, a completely esoteric piece of merchandise, but there's some people who that is like, you know, that's their vibe, right? Like, th- that's the kind of thing that they like to get, and more power to them, and it's gonna look really great in somebody's home, if that's what you're into. I'm not sure if I came down in the middle of the night and I had the Borg Queen skull, you know, sort of just hanging out in my living room, that, you know, I probably would have an out-of-body experience, and not a particularly pleasant one, if I if I laid eyes upon it in the wrong kind of shadowy lighting. But it is an exceptionally cool kind of piece. I'm morbidly curious now to see what my cats would do with it. <laughs> I'll probably knock it, it over. Well, they already, at least one of them tries to hunt the robot vacuum. So I wonder what they would do with this. <laughs> Get assimilated, I think is the right answer. No, I don't want my cats assimilated. <laughs> All right. Well, we've talked about the facts. And now let's speculate on what's going to happen in the future of Star Trek. You make some very good points, Captain. But it's still all speculation and theory. So each week, I and my guest give you a wish or theory we're nurturing about any of the shows or the future of the franchise. So Chris, let's hear your theory or wish for this week. Ooh, so my theory slash wish, I'm hoping to, ho- I'm hoping manifesting this is going to get it out there and, okay. and make it happen. Things have been pretty quiet on the Strange New Worlds front since yep. they wrapped production a couple of months ago. I'm really hoping that Alex has a Christmas present for all of us and we're going to get a teaser for Christmas. Yeah, I'd love that too. I mean, we can't be all that far away now, right? I, I have to believe that that we're close, like either for Christmas or New Year's, right? Yeah, because Discovery Season 4 is on right now. That's going to run through early February. Picard Season 2 is then going to pick up and that's going to run through April, which means that Strange New Worlds is going to come on in May. Well, that's only five months away from now. It's not that long. And we've gotten not a teaser, you know, we have the kind of, you know, the reveal video at Star Trek Day where everybody announced who their characters were and you just got the like tiniest little snippets of 
episode footage which were just sort of glorified like moving pictures of the characters so you could see them wearing the costumes but we've got nothing else other than that and you've got to figure I mean it's probably really complex for them to determine exactly what the right moment is to start spinning up the hype machine for any of the shows since like you know they should also be spinning it up for Picard season two because that's only two months away but yeah it's got it's got to be soon right I mean you know we, they want to build some excitement and this thing's coming maybe May June of this year so so let's get to it we're running out of time and I, I have to think about like the timing of when we got stuff for Picard we got stuff for Picard for first contact day and right. if we're going to get it in February that's I'm doing math that's five, six months out. Yeah. So yeah. if we're going to get Strange New Worlds in May, now is if they're following the same schedule, now is about the time. So yeah. Alex Kurtzman, if you're listening, I would really love a Strange New Worlds trailer for Christmas. <laughs> hey, I think that is a perfectly reasonable Christmas ask, right? It's, you know, we're not asking for... Uh them to greenlight a uh, Enterprise reboot revival. We are asking for just a little bit of, just a little bit of footage from Star Trek Strange New Worlds to, to tide us over. All right, so my theory for this week is <laughs> it's the end of the year, so I'm gonna I'm going with a ridiculous one, which I'm sure is not gonna come true, but I'll I'm gonna give you my evidence all the same. So uh, just a very minor spoiler for this week's episode. At the very beginning of the episode, it's in the like the very first scene, they come to the conclusion that the DMA, someone is controlling it. No idea who, just that it's not a natural phenomenon. And there's this question about, you know, who's in control of it. And I think that's going to play out over a number of episodes still to come. And there has also been this season now a few, well, two big ones, references to Enterprise, the TV show, right? In the in the season premiere, we got the Archer space dark and the little musical fur- flourish of Archer's theme. And, uh, you know, that kind of put us in a, a faith of the heart kind of mood. And then in this this week's episode again one of the races that shows up is the akali from civilization not a great episode of star trek enterprise from the first season and it took me like two-thirds of the episode to be like uh, watching the discovery episode to be like oh my god i think this is a tie-in to star trek enterprise and and this race from the first season of the show and so my theory is they are laying enterprise breadcrumbs along the way this season because the reveal will be that the person responsible for the DMA is, I guess he would be past guy in this context because he is from, while he was from the future relative to Enterprise, he's now from the past relative to Discovery. But yes, my theory is that the big bad this season is future guy from Star Trek Enterprise and that we will finally learn the identity of future guy. And my only evidence is the fact that we've gotten two very big Enterprise tie-ins in episodes this season. If we get a couple more, I'm going to say it's definitely Future Guy and that's who it is. Chris, what do you think? I'm intrigued. You you started this by saying you didn't think it was actually going to pan out, but... I don't know. You've you've made a good case. I have made a good case. I, I you know, it's just one of those things where it just feels like it just feels too fan servicey, right? Like it's just one of those things where it's like you and I want that kind of information, but I don't think any show should ever want to like give us that information other than Star Trek Enterprise, and we can't go back in time and have them come up with it. But it would be really cool, right? Like, you know, if it, if there is some big bad villain, right, all, all they really kind of tell you in this next episode is it's not natural. So if there is some big bad villain associated with it, then who is that? Who could that possibly be? There's obviously a ton of possibilities, either familiar faces or somebody entirely new who we've never met before. And so, yeah, why couldn't it be future guy or I guess past guy in this case? And if the Bran and Braga, like, I think it was Archer all along thing, you know, is something they stick with, then could also be a good way of getting Scott Bakula into the show as well as Future Guy, who is responsible for the DMA and all the challenges in Star Trek Discovery Season 4. You've sold me, Alex. (laughs) If it doesn't go that way, I think you've you've got a great 
a plot of a nice long fan fiction there if you want one yeah right exactly yeah unfortunately too many of my theories i think end up as fan fiction rather than coming true <laughs> hey i'd read that me too i would absolutely read that i'd write that do you have a theory or a wish for discovery picard strange new worlds lower decks or prodigy that you'd like to share Tweet them to me at Weekly Trek or email them to me at Weekly Trek at the Tricorder Transmissions.com and I might feature your theory in a future episode. Well, that's all the time we've got for this episode of Weekly Trek. Thank you so much to my guest, Chris Vanderkamp, for joining me today. Chris, how can people contact you if they want to continue the conversation? You can find me on Twitter at Starfleet STGMGR. That's Starfleet Stage Manager. That's the best way to get hold of me. And you can find this show on Twitter at Weekly Trek and me at Alexander T. Perry. And if you enjoy the show, please consider leaving us a five-star review on your podcast player of choice. And please check out some of the other great shows on the Tricorder Transmissions. And if you like our shows, please also consider becoming a Patreon of Tricorder, which you can find at patreon.com slash the Tricorder Transmissions. And lastly, if you're looking for Star Trek news on the internet, I hope you will turn to trekcore.com. Well, this is our last regular episode of 2021. We will have one more episode next week, which will be our year in review episode. So I just want to wish everybody, since that episode will come out after the holidays, I want to wish everybody a happy holidays. If you aren't listening to this until next week, a happy new year as well. I look forward to picking up the regular episodes in early 2022. There's plenty more to come. We've got a really busy year coming up. But yeah, so thank you, Chris. Thank you to all of my listeners. And until next week, live long and prosper.